couple things before I get started. One is uh, I recognize a few of you. Most of most of you I don't recognize faces. I might recognize your email names on on different forums and so forth because I I frequent a uh, few of them all the time. But uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to send around a piece of paper. If you wouldn't mind, those of you who feel comfortable, give me your name. And if you've got an email name or a name, a web name rather, uh, when you're into websites, uh, put it alongside it so I can start maybe putting some faces with with people that I chat with or see chatting on uh, different web pages. If you don't feel like it, that's okay too. I, I'm, I just try to get to know people a little bit better and when I see a lot of faces, I go, I don't know any of you guys and everybody goes, yeah, you know me. You know, I, no, I'm sorry, but I don't. But I'm gonna pass this around. I'll be passing some other things around and, and uh, so when I pass around gold bars and things, please don't pocket them, pass them on to the next person. And, <laughs> let them look at them and that, but uh, we'll pass a few things around. Uh, I've spent about a week trying to get put together a really good video presentation to go with this and I think I've had the computer crash on me about six times now and totally lose everything. And, uh, and I'm just going to show you a small portion of what I was going to show you because that's all I could manage to put together the last few minutes uh, after it crashed even twice today on me as I tried to get stuff put together. And that's unfortunate, but uh, hopefully the discussion will be vivid enough that if you close your eyes a little bit, you'll be able to visualize the stacks of gold bars we're talking about and so forth. A lot of things, uh, we're going to start out with, uh, with some of the more simple things. And, uh, and you're okay with uh, audio and video recording of this stuff. I'll let you know when it's time to shut everything down. There's reasons. Uh, oftentimes there's reasons why these are unpublished stories and they may be at some time in the future but there's multiple reasons why a lot, a lot of what you're going to hear here today uh, you can't go down to Barnes and Noble and buy a book or something and, and see it maybe at some point in time you can a lot of these uh, a lot of what I'm going to tell you about today and even things I'm going to show you have been shown to me by people who have been dead for a lot, long time now, a lot of them. Uh, but other, one, other people are still alive and have, at, and have told me that I can talk about them briefly without going into too much detail, but, but I'm not, at, uh, uh, not able to let you see things for a long period of time or photograph them or different things because they're not really my property, so to speak, to, to allow that. And so uh, we will have to... Uh, uh, like I say, there, uh, I have people bug me all the time, why don't you publish a lot of this stuff? I've had publishers tell me I've got enough stuff for about seven books and they've probably only seen about a third of what I have. So I'm guessing I got enough for 21 books or something. But, uh, um, and there's several reasons why I have and I've got started on some on the computer, some books. But I, one thing that I've seen in Utah, which I think is unfortunate, and that is I've told people the surest way to have everybody hate your guts is to write a book. Uh, on, on archaeology or, or Spanish or those kind of things. As soon as you write one, everybody hates you. They say, well, they got one word wrong in their book or that, therefore they're a damn liar kind of thing. You know, I'm going, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I, have, I have half of a bookcase full of diaries of stories that are, that I may be the only one left alive in, in many of the cases that has that story still. And um, a lot of times a story is one sentence. That's all there is, and, and I tell people, if you want me to write a book, people, there isn't anybody that's going to go down to Barnes and Noble and, and buy a book that's made up of one sentence, even if the sentence is interesting. You have to make it into a story, and by the time I add a couple of paragraphs to make it a story, then I'm a damn liar because I made up the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. so still wrestling with that. I don't want all my information to die with me when I die, but I haven't decided how to how to deal with some of that to make sure that some of these stories and photos and different things move on. I, I feel bad for some of the people that want to be here from Texas and different places and it's too far for them to travel to be here because they're looking forward to to what goes out online digitized and recorded and so forth but again the only thing that I intend on or that really I want to see leave this room that will be recorded is some of the more mild stuff as we get halfway through then everybody's going to I'll let you know when to shut off your recorders those of you that have something going and then we'll talk about some of the really good stuff but uh, but that 
that will be word of mouth or are the only people that will know about it is those people sitting here in the room. So, um, so with that being said, uh, I'll get this passed around. Oh, I also wanted to mention, for, uh, like I said, people either hate people in this, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a profession, but they either hate them or they love them. It doesn't seem like there's anything in between. For those of you that like Steve Schaefer, I just talked with him yesterday, and uh, he's got a book in, a new book into the publisher at 320 pages. Um, the name of the book is, I think I've got it here, America Before Us. It's being published by Cedar Fort. It's about four to six months from hitting the bookshelves. So if you like him, uh, Barnes & Noble in four to six months, he'll have a big book that should be hitting the bookshelves. Um, we, when I say we, I'm, I'm involved with a group called uh, Morgan Pow Wow. Some of you are aware of that from seeing emails and so forth. We're into our 19th year. We do two, two programs a year, kind of similar to what we're doing here, other than we feed everybody dinner and some other things, have some other entertainment that's involved with it. But uh, our next one's coming up June, June the 6th, I believe it is. It's a Saturday. And we're going to have Will Bagley, if you know who he is, um, will be our speaker. And he's going to be talking about um, Porter Rockwell. And, uh, and also, my understanding is that we're going to ha he's going to have a, whether it's a book or some type of a script there that has not been available since about a month after Porter Rockwell died. Uh, first biography done and so forth to, for sale and those kinds of things. So um, anyway, he's, he's, um, those people that are on my email list, uh, I'll be sending a bio out here on him. He's got a bio longer than your arm of, of national. and and state awards and that in the uh, research and, and historian and so forth and that, but uh, uh, should, should be very interesting uh, one coming up in June. So we need to get started. I'm going to start this paper round. Like I say, don't feel obligated necessarily, but uh, if you feel like it, put your name and if you've got uh, a web name, put that on there too. I've got a pretty loud voice, so once in a while I'll walk up this way where I haven't got the mic. Let me know if I'm not talking loud enough or if I'm mumbling or something like that. But uh, to start with, does everybody know what that is? I, it's interesting the different groups I talk to around because sometimes they're all youngsters and 20 and 30 and sometimes they're about my age. Looks like a lot of you are close to my age, so probably at least a lot of people in here know what that is. Everybody, is there anybody that doesn't know what that is? All right, so to start out with, what's the similarity between a slinky and a politician? They both move sideways. <laughs> Hard to get them started. <laughs> now if I can get this thing working, I'll show you what to... Okay, how come it's... Can't get it to change from the first picture. Let's see here. Oh, maybe, no. Nope. Come on. There you go. Okay. They're not much use to anybody, but they're fun to push down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, let's go the other way. There we go. Needed a sidebar there. So we're going to talk about unpublished Utah stories, and it won't be just Utah, but a majority of them will be Utah. And um, and if uh, because I don't recognize most of you, most of you probably haven't heard these, but but a few of them that I'll talk about, you a majority of you may have. If and I'll probably ask you for raise of hand if you've heard some of these, and we'll skip them if if a majority of people have heard them. Um, and I've got just a few pictures on here. I'll show a few actual photographs uh, that I had digitized most of them. And because I lost them all now, I'll just have to hold them up. And, and if you're interested specifically in some, uh, we, I can show them to you up closer in that afterwards and so forth. But uh, let's, uh, and I can't use a remote, which I was hopeful of doing. 
Okay, talking about maps, and that was one of the things listed uh, on this advertisement, I think, was maps and so forth. So, so what kind of maps are there? Uh, what, what do you expect to see? Most of you, I think, expect to see some of the good old Utah treasure maps from two or three different authors, and they, you see the old Spanish maps with Spanish symbols and pine trees and that kind of thing. There's tons of maps, and I've got drawers full of them, literally, originals. And uh, most of them are modern maps. This particular, and I'll show you something, this, this one has more than one thing, and maybe I can focus that a little bit better. I don't think that picture's that far out of focus. Suppose if I can figure out how to, I'm not sure where they focus this thing. Is that it? There we go. Let's see what we can come up with. Yeah, it's probably not too bad. All right, I'm going to show you here in a second the second part of the map. And what we're interested in is a spot just off the photo about in here with this particular map. And I get a lot of these types of maps from people and so forth. And, and uh, okay, you can see the lake and you see a person pointing. Uh, they were taking the photo real close to where that fingertip is across that lake. Now this is, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the lake and I probably won't remember it, but uh, I know about where it's at, but it's up towards um, uh, Bear Lake Lodge and so forth up that way. But is what this particular person is showing me is there's, it, and by the way, this is on private property unless you know somebody or something. I haven't been up there yet, but uh, I was just shown this last summer. Uh, and I haven't had a chance to make arrangements to go up there yet, but I've been invited to go up. And where he's pointing, there's, there's a number of Spanish symbols right there. And there's Spanish symbols all over the Utah. I mean, not just a few, they're, they're everywhere. And the ones you get in the books and that, just a very small uh, group of them. But uh, those two go together, and so he's, He's shown the, a vision of the, uh, or a picture of the lake, and then he's showing me on a map, and should be able to walk right to that and find his Spanish symbols. Don't know what the Spanish symbols are, and the guy who showed it to me doesn't follow this kind of thing, so he doesn't have any clue what the Spanish symbols are. Here's uh, taken out of an archaeological book. And uh, Ashley Dry Fork region, a lot of you are familiar with the area out around Vernal and that. Uh, this is just something picked up going through some old book one time. And uh, as you look down below, they talk about campsites, caves, earth lodge, village, cave groups, pictographs, and so forth. And so, so there's, uh, uh, on that particular map, uh, just a pencil drawing quite a bit of information where you can find all kinds of Indian things out in the Vernal area. Things that you're typically not going to find in a book or something. Um, and another picture of it, let's see. Let's go this one. Okay, if we're talking about treasures, that doesn't look real ancient. Uh, I'll talk through some of these real fast and leave out a lot of details just so we can get through a bunch of it. I have a friend who uh, recently got called by a lady that lives about four houses down the street. She said, uh, my late husband had some guns and so forth, and, and uh, he's, uh, I've got a little bit of ammunition here in the house. Are you interested in it? My friend was uh, quite a bit into guns and so forth, and he says, sure, and he's envisioning maybe two boxes of 30-odd six shells or something. This is on a Wednesday. He says, I'll come over and have a look, and he thinks he'll wait till Sunday, and then after he hangs up the phone, he gets thinking, he decides maybe he better go over. So he goes over to her house, she tells him her husband had built a hidden room in the back of the garage. She had had two home teachers, for those of you who don't know, that's a Mormon term for people that come over and make sure you're doing okay. They came over and she says, can you help me figure out how to get in this room? They looked all over, couldn't see there was a room there or any way to get into it. So she says, well, why don't you take this sledgehammer and let's break the wall down? So they broke the wall down in the garage. Sure enough, when he gets over there, there's a back room, secret room, and there's all kinds of ammunition and stuff in it. And she says, well, are you interested? And he says, yeah. And she says, how much would you give me for it? And he says, well, 
best I can do is $2,600 because my wife will kill me after that, maybe before that. But uh, she says, okay, you can have all, everything. And he says, well, wait a minute. He says, I think that, and there were some big gun safes and things back in the room too. And he says, what's in those? And she says, guns. And he, he says, anything good? And she says, I can't get into them. But she says, I know my husband gave away all the good guns before he died. So it's just some junk stuff in there. She knew the combination, but she didn't know how to get it open. So she gave him the combination. Uh, Mike opened up the gun safes and there was 16 guns in the gun safe. <laughs> and so she says, well, uh, originally he, I think he told her he'd give her $600, I think, for the ammunition. And then she says, well, what would you give me for everything? The safes, the guns, everything. $2,600. So that was, and he says, that's all I can afford. And she says, well, you can have it all for that, no problem. He says, haven't you got some boys or something that maybe would like some of these? And so she called her son right while they were standing there and said, guys, offer me 2600 bucks. And he says, take it and run. So she says, it's yours for $2,600. Two pickup trucks full of ammunition and, and reloading equipment and 16 guns in the safe. He took, he took the guns down to be appraised. This rifle appraises for $35,000. And some of the other weapons aren't worth quite that much, but very valuable weapons. He went back to the woman and he says, I don't feel good about this. We've got to do something to make this fair. He says, they're worth way more than I thought they were worth. She says, you know, my husband, had a, was an orthodontic surgeon for 40 years in California. He left me with a lot of money in that, and she says, if you think you got a good deal, then I think that's a good thing, and you need to just go home and be happy with what you've got. <laughs> Is that a treasure? Boy, to me, that's a treasure. Uh, and, and, and I see a lot of them like that. They're out there, uh, and I hear about them quite a bit, but... Uh, uh, these kinds of things are always fun. This is up in Park City. We just at New Year's were, went to a ghost town over in California and there was probably about 40 different mining carts scattered through the ghost town. Uh, they're protected so that people can't haul them off or obviously they would have been gone a long time ago, but they, they're all quite different that, from each other. There's all kinds of different ones. Um, those things are getting real hard to come by and it costs you a lot of money if you want to buy one. Uh, I go out to a lot of... Uh, ghost towns and so forth to a lot of cemeteries. And, uh, what are those? you have any idea? Those are dinosaur eggs. Okay, and I run into a guy and we were talking and he says, I got something I want you to see. And he goes to his truck and he brings this in and says, what do you think of that? And I says, boy, that's pretty cool. And uh, he was telling me that uh, he had a jeweler that did a lot of work for him. And uh, he walked in a shop one day and that was in one of the glass cases and he said some guy owed him some money and couldn't pay him so he brought that in and says would you take this for what I owe you and he took it so this guy bought it from him but I have a guy and we'll talk about his story today uh, uh, who lives down in central Utah he was raised down there and he's moved back now but he lived up in the Ogden area but uh, he told me that the ranch he was raised on has dinosaur nests all over the ranch with eggs in them all kinds of them. These things are worth a fortune. And he says, yeah, when we're kids, we saw hundreds of these things, different kinds of eggs in them and so forth. Of course, Utah's a really rich place for the dinosaur eggs and such. This one really isn't my story, but we'll talk about it briefly. Anybody in here know what that is? Okay, so we've got at least one person in here that knows what it is. Let me uh, show you another picture close-up of it. Okay, that, uh, we'll go back to the first one here. Last year, last summer, excuse me, summer before last, um, private property, central Utah, two men entered a cave on private property down there. There was two unusual stones inside the cave. One of the stones gave off light. They didn't dare touch it. They left it where it was. This is the other stone which they took out, which I've been able to handle and so forth. They've done electron microscope, uh, a lot of electron microscope photographs, and they've taken little flakes of the, of the different colors off to run testing on them to see if it's a fraud or if it's real to, to see what the pigments are made up of. It's got uh, human, human urine. It's got... Uh, 
uh, human blood. It's got all kinds of different things in these pigments. Uh, it, it is authentic back to 1600 BC, found in central Utah. They're trying to do some more work with the cave right now to determine if there's other antiquities and so forth in the cave. Um, there's lots of really cool stuff that happens in Utah, and obviously not hardly anybody hears about it. You haven't seen it in a book. I don't know if you ever will. And, and um, how big is that camera? That's about the size of a ostrich egg on a rock, just a stone, like a river stone. Um, and this doesn't give it justice when you can see it good. And I've got some better pictures if if my all my machines and machinery hadn't given me so much grief and I lost my presentations. I've got pictures of the back and that, which is just a regular river rock and that. But this thing is about the quality of something you'd expect to see in the Louvre or something like that, just painted on a river rock. Uh, very interesting piece of uh, antiquity. Um, I, can't, I, I can't tell you those kind of things on any of this stuff. I mean, I, to, to be honest with you, I don't know who owns it. I know who had access to it when I saw it, but, but I can't even give you that information. That's, that's not for me to give, so. Uh, this particular one, uh, oh, let's see, I probably, I wonder if I brought my laser. Probably didn't. Okay, uh, let me get up this close, I can't see. This is a private drive. Right parallel to it here is count, uh, County Road. Uh, this road, if you came past me, this way you'd go right along the south edge of the main runways for Hillfield. So some of you might know where I'm talking about. If you go up here just uh, about a block past where we're at, you either go right and head up towards Farmington and that, or you go left and head towards South Weber and South Ogden and so forth. That canyon right here, um, about a half mile up that canyon, is one of three places that I know of within about a five mile radius there that has ancient Egyptian writing. Okay, one's up by North Ogden Divide, one's just barely on the Davis County side from Smith Creek, which isn't too far from this location, but up by the top. And then this location here has just been found recently. This location, it's on a great big boulder that apparently broke off a cliff and fell down. There's a trail that goes between the cliff and the boulder that's laying there. And the hieroglyphics are on the boulder. Uh, the one up in North Ogden Divide was found a couple of years ago by a Boy Scout group taking a hike, uh, parked in the parking lot at North Ogden Divide hiked off and when they got tired and thirsty they stopped to rest when the scout masters was hiking around and found a stone box with Egyptian hieroglyphics carved on it. And then the one up at the top of Smith Creek includes a structure. There's a foundation and so forth. It's very low in the thick brush, so very hard to find. And it's got steps and different things inside the structure, but uh, it's got a stone that looks similar to a big headstone or something like that with Egyptian hieroglyphics inside the structure that's been found. And so, so another group of people. I just heard in the last week, I've got about maybe 20 news stories in the last week to two weeks from different people. Heard from two different people. And we'll probably show you uh, down towards Centerville in the last few years, there's been a few hundred ancient coins that date back to about 200 BC that have been found along with other treasure swords, uh, brooches, large crystals, different things. Now they've just found south of Salt Lake, coming this way but not this far, they found about 20,000 more coins that date to about 200 BC just recently, uh, right at about the Bonneville lake level, the shoreline level. Um, What's that? This lake level also. This thing? Yes. Uh, that I couldn't tell you. I haven't, I, I've seen photographs of this, but I haven't hiked up to it yet because the photographs we just saw for the first time last fall, or this, this lat, I mean just recently. And I haven't had a chance to try to hike up there and, and locate it myself and do some 
heavy duty photography work on this particular one. Um, but, uh, but one thing we know for sure, oh, and, and then I also heard another story just uh, yesterday, I guess it was, uh, in the Manti area, and I've taken tours, I take tours of people down to Manti area, and there's hundreds of things to see down there that date back to about the time of Christ. And, I, and I'll take two-day tours of people and stuff and take them down there and show them stuff. And we only look at a small portion of what I know about down in the Manti area. But I just found out yesterday from somebody that there's an ancient uh, quarry that I di didn't know about that has some of the stones still there that have been cut out for buildings. And one of them has Zeus carved in it, three-dimensional, like a, like a Greek carving and that right in the stone itself and that uh, I find out things like that on a on a regular basis sometimes talking to people uh, when I leave my office and come back I'll find uh, uh, CDs on my desk with no name on them and that pictures and that uh, sometimes there's written information uh, sometimes people come in and talk to me they leave books on my desk uh, and different publications, writing, and so forth. And a lot of it, I don't know who they come from. They just show up in my office and those kind of things. But uh, uh, I've got pretty good rapport with federal government. We talk to BLM, we talk to the Park Service, and so forth, and we trade information. And a lot of times they'll, uh, like when we'll go, go drive all the way down to St. George, I live up in the Ogden area, drive all the way down to look at a new site and photograph it and we'll get down there and they'll have those signs where you can't step off the asphalt because you're gonna wipe out all the plants in the entire world you know kind of thing and they say you can't hike you can't get off the road or anything and so then I'll go in upset tell them hey I drove all the way down from Ogden to take some pictures and now your signs say I can't step off the road and they'll say well we're not gonna let you go in there but we'll tell you some secret places where you can go in and photograph instead so they'll share some sites with me and they'll say don't stay in there very long just half hour or something come back out and so they'll let us go in and then uh, and then while I'm in photographing and come back out I'll find some rare pottery or something like that and I'll go tell them and it makes them mad because they don't have enough money in their coffers for the state archaeologists and so forth to look at some of this stuff and so when you give it to them it just increases their workload that they already can't do and so they get upset at you but anyway let's continue on uh, this was kind of an interesting guy. Uh, real quick story. I just uh, just a couple of months ago got to see this guy and a bunch of other uh, pieces. And uh, the guy who collected this, uh, it was on a uh, on a shoreline that was being washed, and he said you walk along and you could pick up arms and legs and, and body pieces and everything all along. And he says he walked down the beach quite a ways from where he picked this up. And uh, I believe this was the one that did not have this leg here on it. And he picked, pulled another leg out, put it up on it, and just snapped it together like it was a tinker toy or something. It snapped together and stayed there. No glue, nothing. It was built to have pieces pop together on them and so forth. By the way, these were not found in Utah, but uh, I just drew one or two pictures of, of, we had hundreds of pieces, but we were looking at. A lot of you know what that is? Do you know what that is? That's gold sight. So, and so it depends on how much you're into that story of, of uh, the lost Josephine up above Camus. Uh, I've seen some of the some of these pieces that are polished and ready to go on bolo ties or something have sold for over ten thousand dollars a piece. One of a kind. There's no place else in the world where gold side exists, and they look quite nice. I don't know that I'd pay ten thousand dollars for that for bol I know I went for bolo tie because I don't like bolo ties, but. Uh, um, and that gets to be kind of interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about Lost Josephine Mine because I know of at least at least three Lost Josephine Mines in the state of Utah. Um, and there's probably a lot more than that just in the state of Utah. The way they got their name, Lost Josephine, was it, it was real popular. If you were Spaniard, you named, found a good mine, you named it after the Queen of Spain. And so when the Queen of Spain was named Josephine, every Spaniard out there found something and 
named it Lost Josephine, or it's a Josephine mine, and now if it's lost, we got tons of them all over the place. So um, we'll talk about at least one other one here in the state of Utah that I know quite a bit about. And uh, all right, let's see. Oh, by the way, this uh, the big chunk there, is eight pounds, and that was appraised at one hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars. That's gold site. Um, I was going to ask him if I could give him ten dollars and take it home and put it in my rock garden before he said how much it was appraised at. <laughs> I didn't figure he was going to sell it to me for twenty bucks, so I didn't even bother to ask. But okay, uh, um, that you can't see real good, but and you won't be able to see it great this way either because it's in a little container but I'm gonna pass it around this is the first one please don't put it in your pocket um, in fact I'll pass a couple two or three around and, and you can look at it um, this one's kinda interesting I did want to tell the story and this is one that you don't have to turn off your projectors for that this this coin and five others that were all different mean a lot to me. There's not much value in the coin. The coins date back in the 1500s. The reason it means a lot to me because I found these coins in 1963 in uh, Mazer, Utah. Do you, anybody know where Mazer is? It's just outside of Vernal. Okay, uh, me and a friend, I was in third grade, and me and a friend were playing, he's actually a year older than me, we were playing third and fourth great games. We were playing tag, tag, you're it, and you turn around and run, and hopefully he can catch you and tag you, and now you're it. And I was chasing my friend, and he jumped down in a big ir irrigation ditch. It was too big to jump over. We jumped over a smaller one above it, came down to that one, and you had to jump in the bottom. It was dry. There's no water in it, and jump out on the other side. He jumped, he jumped down in the ditch and found a coin down in the ditch. So we got down there looking around, and before it was all over, we dug out of the ditch bank 21 coins. I got six, he got the rest of the 21 coins. Um, he had a couple of silver coins which were in pretty nice shape. These are bronze or brass or something and they're not in, in good shape to say the least. You could see different things on different coins. Some you could see things better than others. Some were worn a lot more than others. But we could pull off dates and so forth. Uh, uh, off some of the coins and got them back into the 1500s and that they were not Spanish coins. Uh, I got by far the best piece because I got six coins. There was a lot of belt or buckles. There's a lot of buckles and a lot of bones. And of course being in third grade we couldn't have cared less about the buckles or the bones either one. We didn't have a metal detector, didn't know anything about them. So we dug around the ditch bank when we didn't real quickly find some coins we were done. And uh, Besides my, and so we left all the buckles and all the bones. I'd love to go back. I can walk you right to the spot exactly. Um, but the problem is it was in an irrigation ditch alongside a state highway, which has been widened now, and there's asphalt over the top of it on a state road. But um, what I did find besides my six coins is I found a gold medal that was about that high out of solid gold and about that wide. And it was, um, it was depicting the birth of Christ. It had a manger on it and so forth. And for the star over the manger, it had a ruby inlaid in it. Uh, it had an inscription on the back, which we did get translated. And it was first place in a speech contest. That was the prize for the first place winner in a speech contest. It had a hole in the top, put a ribbon or something and hang it around your neck and so forth. My parents took it away from me as soon as I got home as a third grader. I said, hey, look what I found. Found a treasure up there. And, and we had two safes in the house and, and they said, we're going to put this in safe. When you get old enough to know what to do with it, you can have it back. So when I got going to BYU, I thought I was old enough to know what to do with it. I said, mom, I want my coins and my gold medal back. She says, what are you talking about? She couldn't even remember the story at all or anything about it. So we went and opened the safes, dug through the safes, not in there, nothing in there. I found this coin and one of the other six coins in one of her junk drawers. That's all I found so far. Don't know if I'll ever recover 
the other four coins and, and of course the gold medal, very valuable. Gold doesn't grow, these things do. They've been buried in the ground for hundreds of years. But um, uh, so hopefully at some point in time, my mother's dead now and that, but uh, I've got a sister still living in her house and she's still got some of the junk drawers and different things. I'm hoping that we find the coins and my gold medal. But uh, uh, real quick, I'll tell you another one. We'll get past it around too. Uh, this is a, well, I'll read it to you. 1881 Carson City counterfeit, counterfeit silver dollar found at Terrace, Utah. You know where Terrace, Utah is? One of the ghost towns up at the north end of the Great Salt Lake where the railroad used to go around before they did the Lucerne cutoff and came across the lake. Okay, the railroad used to go around. And so it says it was uh, found July 12th, 1968 at the main city public restroom eight feet down. The privy hadn't been used for about 50 years, so somebody digging out all that good stuff in the in the privy that every, that was a public privy, and eight feet down they found about 68 of these. This is the only one of the counterfeit coins that was flawed, and and when I pass around, you'll see the flaws. Of, the rest were perfect, front and back. You couldn't tell the difference uh, from those in a real silver dollar. If you took a real silver dollar in this one and you threw them down on a table at the same time, it's real easy to tell because one of them sounds like you threw a bag of flour on the table and the other one makes a little ding, 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 ding sound like that. So uh, uh, another one, of course, it was a number of years ago, but, uh, but these things are out there. I, I hear stuff like this found all the time. People give up and think everything's found and all these different things and it's not so. There's things found pretty much every day out there. Okay, uh, you know what that is, anybody? We have any coin people in here? It's not all that old. Can you read the date on there? 1933. People will argue, the coin people, not whether, whether or not this is true, but, but uh, a lot of stuff to probably back up. This is the most rare coin in the world. Or excuse me, not, well, it probably is the most rare, but also the most valuable coin in the world. Have any idea why that would be so valuable? There was thousands of them mended. The government, uh, they hadn't been shipped out yet. They'd made them all up and the war started and they called them all back in and melted them all down. And so there was, uh, whenever they make new coins, new currency of any kind, paper or anything, they send six, I think it is, to Smithsonian to go in the archives and then they distribute the rest. And so they'd already sent the six out to Smithsonian or whatever. Somebody stole about 10 of them, they figure. And they destroyed the rest of them. They're illegal to have. If you were to find one out there, uh, you would potentially go to prison. They would confiscate it and destroy it if they know you have it. Uh, the reason that this, there, there's, uh, there's one out there that, that is legal. And the way it became legal was it was during the war, a uh, big coin collector over in Germany, I think it was, a, uh, like a king or something. I don't know what you called him, but uh, anyway, he, he got wind of this coin. He wanted it. Uh, you couldn't send any gold out of the co country during the war of any amount without approval from the federal government. So they did the paperwork and they come in front of some guy that's signing off to have thousands of tanks shipped here and guns shipped there and troops shipped over there. And when it came in front of him with another 100,000 papers, he was just signing them as fast as he could. Signed the paper for him and it made that one coin legal. It sold at auction for over six million dollars for that one coin. Any of the other ones that are found are still illegal and would be confiscated and destroyed. And uh, all of you know what that is. Do all of you know about the auction that took place this last summer with the Mormon gold coins? They, uh, they had an auction, somebody had a full set which would be a $1, a $2.50, a $5, a $10, and a $20. And uh, they had an auction that sold, sold them not as a set, but individually. The $10 Mormon gold piece sold for over three quarters of a million dollars. Did we already send around one of them? Yeah, I think so. We'll send one of these around. And by the way, Hall Brothers back here, this is one of their 
uh, mint pieces that I was given some time ago. Appreciate that. But most people have seen this one. But there's a single, I think it's a $20 gold piece, that had a lion on it. And most people aren't even aware that even existed. So, so this one, when you see it, this was a bicentennial uh, stamp uh, celebrating the bicentennial. And it'll show you what uh, the lion, which you, ne you never see when they show them. They nearly always show the all C&I and, and, and those kinds of things. But uh, um, we're getting close probably to the time we need to shift gears. I'll I'm going to tell you at least one more quick story and pass this around. Anybody know what those are called? Finger bar. Okay, everybody dreams of finding the, the, the Spanish gold in the great big chunks and that. And, I, and we'll tell you some stories here once all the recorders go off about some of the big ones that are so big that one man can't even move it, not slide it, not do anything. I mean, there's some big ones here in Utah. but. These were the most common. That's called a finger bar because you'd go to a sandbar, you'd push your finger down in, and that's your mold for the gold. And they would do these and they'd do what's called buttons. And a button is simply pouring the gold out and making a little round spot. Just pour it out on the ground or whatever your, your mold material was, make a little spot, it's called a button. The reason they like to do these, a lot of different reasons. First of all, you gotta have a lot of gold to pour a big bar, number one. But when you load your donkeys up to take them back south and that, uh, they'd about kill the donkeys loading them up and that. And, you got, and if you wanna balance them, get a load that your, each individual donkey can carry and balance side to side in the packs. This kind of thing in the little buttons, way easier to balance, move back and forth on your packs and so forth and deal with than a bar that you can't carry or neither can the donkey kind of thing. So I'll pass that one around and I'll tell you the story on that one. A um, number of years ago, three guys in the Duchesne area had a map or something and they dug up several hundred of these finger bars. This bar that's going around is the smallest finger bar of the group. Okay, the smallest one of the group. And they, they got a bunch of buttons and they got a bunch of finger bars. Um, they announced they had them and they were for sale. Took about two days to sell about a million dollars worth of them. Everybody got them, threw them in their safety deposit box. Uh, by the way, you'll notice that as it comes around that this finger bar doesn't have any markings on it, which would mean it was uh, contraband. It's uh, uh, if it was legal tender with the with the Spaniards, it would have it would have assay marks. It would have uh, telling how pure that somebody had assayed it, that w how pure the metal was, who the miner was, who owned the mine. Uh, it would show that the royal fifth had been paid to the king of Spain. It would show all ki there's all kinds of different stamps that go in what would be considered a legal Spanish bar. There was they figured there was a lot more contraband. Of course, you could lose your life or anything else if they found out you're taking out all that money without paying the royal fifth and all those kind of things. But, uh, but anyway, so, so uh, you can legally own a bar like this with no markings on it. You can't legally own if there's markings on it. Now it falls under the Antiquities Act and it belongs to the government. And so so as far as finding, finding yourself a treasure, this is the best way to find it. The, the antiquity bars are worth a lot more money, of course, because they're, they have antiquity value, more than just the gold value, but, but you could own a bar like that with no markings on it. Um, so anyway, they sold all these bars out. Everybody grabbed them up. Some people bought quite a few of them, threw them in their safety deposit box. Everybody was happy as could be with their treasures that they now own. And, um, a guy that I worked with, his father and his grandfather had bought several of them. And by the way, his grandfather, some of you might have his book, uh, J.C. Wilkinson, as his grandfather. Uh, he's written a couple of books on, on sacred uh, Rhodes Mine and so forth. And um, anyway, they'd bought a number of bars. And so the guy I worked with, who was uh, the grandson of J.C. Wilkinson, he says, uh, he says, Dad, he says, uh, you want me to tell you how good your bar is, your gold bar, what the, what the percentage of gold is in it? Because, you know, smelling it up here in the mountains before they take it back and re-refine it and that, you're lucky to get, 
eighty percent or you know different things like that and you'll get copper and and you'll get uh, silver and all kinds of other things in the bar he says you want to know how much gold's in there and he, he says my father-in-law works for a, a military contractor there in Ogden and they have a, uh, they have a a uh, spectral analysis machine. Now normally it costs you six hundred to a thousand dollars. I think it's gone down quite a bit now, but back then it'd be six hundred to a thousand dollars to test that bar. Well if you paid a thousand dollars for it, not too many people are going to pay a thousand dollars to see how good it is. Uh, but he says, I can get it done for you for free. And he says he says, Yeah, I want I want that done. So he gave him this bar that's passing around. This this is the bar out of the million dollars worth of, of gold that was sold and it was taken down to have a spectral analysis run on it. When you put that in the machine, it gives you a printout and it will, big long printout, and it'll tell you every mineral, everything in there, every kind of, of silver and copper and everything else, it'll tell you the exact percentage in that bar of what everything is. So it starts spitting out all these numbers, it gets to gold and it says that the amount of gold, the percentage of gold in that bar is point zero 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 one eight seven or something to that effect. You probably get more gold out of a glass of water. All right, so it's what these guys had done, and they had a great scam going. They bought a real gold bar, finger bar, and then they drilled a hole in it and they collected all the filings and that from drilling the hole and they took the bar and the filings they went to a reputable assay shop in Salt Lake, they gave them the gold and the filings and they says uh, check this out. They ran an assay on it and they and they wrote them a authenticated letter. This is an authentic gold bar. This is the percentages of gold so forth. Gave that back to them and they took it to another person here in the state who was well known and liked by people and and he looked at the assay sheet and he looked at the gold bar and everything and he wrote them a letter of, of authenticity and said yeah this is legitimate stuff. Then they took that and they used that to sell everybody their bars. Oh and they also wanted to make sure their bars looked really good. So they did the the finger molds and they poured copper in there and then when they got it figured out so they got them looking good then they gold plated them. Gold plating, of course, about a millionth of an inch thick. So what you're seeing and handling there is real gold. There just isn't enough to buy a cup of coffee or anything on there. But uh, uh, And so then they sold everybody these gold bars. That bar that you're handling sent three guys to prison for quite a few years on a scam. And so, and I'm sure there's quite a few guys in Utah that still have a bunch of these in a safety deposit box that think they're rich. And they probably got it in their wills that for their kids to inherit them and everything, and they're not worth anything. I, I had the bar doing lectures and that with it for about a year and a half or so, and then the family wanted it back. I offered to give them $20, and they says, $20? We spent $1,000 on that thing. He says, yeah, but that's when it was worth $1,000. Now it's only worth about 10 cents. So. And they went and sell it to me, and then uh, just at Christmas time, they called me and said, if you want that, we'll sell it to you. And they come down, and then they didn't even sell it to me. They left on my desk and left, and I sent them an email and says, where should I send the money? And they said, just a Christmas present. So I got that for a Christmas present this year. But, but um, all right, we're, uh, let's see if there's anything else we need to look at. And then, oh, well, here's, here's the back side of a, Oh, I, and I do have to tell you one more story. Some of these are good stories, whether they're the best one or not. And this, by the way, is, and that's a, a poor picture, but the picture's taken like in 1927, and it's, and it's not a lot better than that, the original photograph. That's some Indian petroglyphs up north of Ogden, that on private property. And it's really hard to get in there and, and see that. This is actually was shot back in like 1927. I'm trying to make arrangements to get in and see some of these panels. These are fantastic panels, but nobody gets to see them because to tell you who the private property owner is, it's Thaikal. So uh, they don't particularly care who you are or anything else. But I do have some connections, and I'm hoping to be able to get in there and look at those. But uh, anyway, so so... Digitally, I had hundreds of photos to show you. Basically, that's the end of it because, as some of you know, I had uh, my program that I set up and was putting pictures on crashed on me about six times in the last week, and I totally lost everything, and I, and I had a whole bunch. So for the rest of this, you, you're going to have to close your eyes probably and, and envision some of the things I tell you. I will show you some, a few stills and so forth. But uh, I did want to tell you one more story since we were talking about 
Mormon gold pieces. Everybody familiar with Barnes Bank? And know what happened to Barnes Bank? Probably most of you don't really know what happened to Barnes Bank other than you know they don't exist anymore. Here about six, seven years ago when the economy went south, Barnes Bank folded their doors and they've been around since Brigham Young. Um, they, uh, they, were actually, they were actually solvent bank more so than most all the other banks, but, but a, a political move by the federal government, they wanted them closed. And so they were forced into closure and they went out of business. And so uh, when they were going out of business, they, uh, of course, they're gonna close their doors. So they contact all the people that, that are dealing with them and they says, uh, you know, you've got a safety deposit box in our bank. On this day, we're closing the doors forever. You have to come in and get everything out of your safety deposit boxes and so forth. And they notified everybody. Well, there's so many safety deposit boxes and so much valuable stuff that they contact police, sheriff's department, highway patrol, and they have people down there in the lobbies and, and so forth protecting people as they come in and empty safety deposit boxes to take an open account in another bank or whatever. And so uh, a friend of mine was uh, uh, hired by a highway patrolman to come and replace his hot water heater. This is up towards the north side of the Great Salt Lake. And so he gets up there and he's replacing the hot water heater and the highway patrolman comes down, he watches him a little bit and that, and he goes, hey, I've got a good story for you. He says, uh, just last week, he says, uh, I got called up to go down to Barnes Bank to just, you know, help watch so that there weren't robberies taking place while they're emptying all these uh, safety deposit boxes and everything. He says, this little old lady in her 90s comes walking in and walks down there and says, I, want, I need to get my stuff out of your bank, I guess, and here's my key. So they go down and she's got the biggest safety deposit box in the bank. They go up and turn the locks and everything and the guy tries to pull the thing out and he can't budget and he gets another guy to help him and the two of them can't budget and they and they call for uh, this highway patrolman and that and they get about three or four people on it and they get this thing pulled out take it over and throw it up on the counter and then they kind of back off to give her privacy and that but one of the guys says well it's really none of our business but if you don't mind what have you got in that thing and she op she says oh you can see and she opens it up and they come and look and it's full of gold bars and gold coins and, and the whole thing's gold but it's you know typical of what a lot of collectors and that might have or people who who think the end of the world's coming and want to put some gold away and silver and so forth that kind of stuff but the real killer on the thing aside from there being a lot of gold in there gold there was gold dust and gold flakes and gold nuggets anything you imagine in gold but it was all gold in there there was two rolls a Mormon gold coins in the, in there. And he says uh, they got those big canvas bank bags and they loaded up about four bank bags full of gold and they took them out for her and put them in the back of her car and she got in her car and <laughs> drove down the road. I got after him. I says, how come you didn't get a name? See if she was adopting somebody, you know. But <laughs> Is she married? <laughs> If she isn't, she ought to be. I know a few people who, who have uh, gold, Mormon gold coins. Uh, in fact, last winter, I was asked to come and do a, a presentation, historical presentation on Utah to a little group of, of widows, little uh, older women, uh, widows. There was about 10 of them or so. And it was a house in West Point. And I went down and gave the presentation and I and I was talking about and passing around, I've got two or three uh, Mormon gold coins are uh, as near as we can tell and I've taken them to some people and they can't tell me for sure on some of them so far, but uh, they could easy enough by weighing them in that, but as near as we can tell, two of them are, are fakes, three of them are fakes, and one they can't tell for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's faker. Uh, I don't know which one I'm passing around. Maybe I'm passing around a real one to, for you to look at. But, uh, um, but I think all of mine are just replicas, probably. But I passed one around in that. And the lady whose house we were at, and she was, she's in her 90s, and she says, I got one of those. And I says, yeah, really? Where's it at? I figured she'd say in her safety deposit box, oh, I throw it in with my silverware and stuff, you know, in the drawer. 
And I'm going, okay. That this was about the time that had the auction and one sold for three quarters of a million dollars. And I thought, I don't know if I'd throw that in my silver drawer. Her sister is the one that invited me, and her sister takes care of the older sister. And uh, and I asked her later. I says, uh, Do you think, you know, she had all these women there and that? And I says. You know, on another day or another night, you think we could go back and I could photograph her coin? Because I photographed a few from other people that I know. And she says, no. And it kind of surprised me because I figured it'd be no big deal, especially if you throw it in your silverware drawer. That, And I says, why do you think we can't do that? And she says, because I'm her sister and she won't even let me see it. She says, she got that from mom and she won't let any of the rest of the family see it. So, so I haven't seen it, but I know she has it. And I have seen... Uh, uh, from other people now. I was going to tell you, uh, just kind of to give you an idea of some numbers, I've got about 10 of these diaries full of stories, uh, one of a kind stories from people that have died and so forth on, uh, on a lot of stuff. Um, I'll show you a couple other things and then we'll get into some of these better stories here in a second. I have some di other binders around, but this is another thing I do in my research and so forth is uh, I've got three ring binders that are full of photographs and, and documentation. And again, some of this stuff is things that have been left on my desk. I don't even have any idea where these things are. They'll just come in and leave a CD on my desk or DVD. And uh, sometimes there'll be information, sometimes there'll be G uh, GPS coordinates, all kinds of things. A lot of it's my own research, but, uh, but I for research purposes, I try to get pictures on things that I'm working on. Um, we talked about giants. I guess we ought to talk about that. I'll try to take out things I don't care if you're recording. Um, giants has been one of my favorite things to study for quite a few years. And there's lots and lots of information out there on giants. Uh, you can't find a lot in books. And for those of you who love to talk about um, Government conspiracies and cover-ups. This, this is one of the biggest ones there is out there, although we're starting to break the shell. I, I understand that Smithsonian's starting to finally fess up to a few things because of the internet. It's getting too hard to keep things covered up. But you can find lots and lots and lots of newspaper articles dating back from the 1800s and so forth coming forward where a lot of giants and so forth. Ohio Valley, Ohio River Valley is where a vast majority of them in the United States are found. And, and they find thousands of them, literally. They, I've got information on one graveyard where they've identified over 3,000 giants in one graveyard. And, and I have the coordinates and so forth. But uh, uh, a lot of these things get turned over to Smithsonian and then Nobody ever hears of them again. And if you go and ask them, they say, we don't know what you're talking about. Uh, this is, to me, is, is the best. There's a lot of books out there, actually, that you can find. This one's got tape on it, but it's called Genesis 6, Giants, uh, Master Builders of, i got to look in here, Master Builders of the Prehistoric and Ancient Civilization. It's not cheap. You get on Amazon and that, and you're going to pay probably 50 bucks or more for that. But, uh, but probably the best one that I found on it, but uh, to give you an idea, and I wish I could show you this on overhead, but these are showing, and they tell you the, the documentation where you can find information on these skeletons. But this little guy right here, if you can see him, right here, that's six foot tall. Th these are to the scale, these giants that have been found. This is a six foot tall guy right here. Now I'd like to see, I've got photos in that of them up to about 10 foot tall. Let me show you a 10 foot tall guy. And I'll tell you what, you put a tape measure up a wall or something and try to, uh, to 10 feet and try to imagine a guy there that's about 10 feet tall. This guy right here is 9 feet tall. And this one's 13 feet tall. This one over here, the big guy, 36 feet tall. If you could find something like that, I definitely want to be your buddy and I want to photograph him. <laughs> yeah, we put it in here. Anyway, um, one of the things I want to tell you about on giants that I chased, I've got a whole drawer full of pictures on of um, some specific giants. Uh, here in the, Uni in the United States, they found several in Florida 
and we've actually found several here in Utah and found several over in Nevada. Those are the three states that I know of. There's probably more than that, but I'm, those are the ones I'm aware of. I've done quite a bit of research on the ones in Nevada, and I've got some photographs of some of the ones here in Utah. Um, in Nevada, Lovelock Cave, if you know where Lovelock, Nevada is, out in beautiful Nevada, um, okay, uh, the city Lovelock, if you go kind of over on the west edge and then you go about eight miles south into the desert, there's what's called Lovelock Cave out there. And there's, and there's quite, a few, quite a story that goes with it, and, some, and they vary some, but they're pretty close. But basically what ended up happen, happening is in doing a bunch of research, the Indians, and I think they're Paiutes, could be wrong on that, but the Indians that are still alive today started telling these archaeologists, uh, as they're telling the history of their tribe, that there used to be tribes up to the north that were cannibals when they were giants, and they would come down and round up the Indians and take them back and eat them. And of course, they didn't look too kindly on that, they, and they were terrified by it. They were giants, they'd come down, whenever they saw them, they knew they were down to collect some bodies to take back and eat. And so, uh, one day one of the one of the men in the tribe was out hunting and he runs across a few of them and they're, and they're in, living in Lovelock Cave uh, or they're staying there in Lovelock Cave and so he, uh, he goes uh, back to his tribe and he says, hey, there, there's a group of them down here and I know where they're at and so the whole tribe picks up and instead of running they go up to where these guys are. They drive them back into the cave and, they, and, and stoning them and so forth and basically bury them up in, inside the cave and so uh, Anyway, over the years, the bats get in there and everything, and all the bat guan and that falls on them, and it, and it uh, mummifies them. And so they still have skin on them, they've still got hair on them, and so forth. And then uh, finally, uh, modern, and then moved to modern day, and, uh, and you had people go in there several years ago. Uh, bat guan was a huge thing. If you could find enough, it probably still would be today, but probably EPA and everybody would keep you from mining it. But it was great fertilizer. And so you got somebody in there mining out all this bat guana, and they come across and they dig out these Indian mummies uh, that are giants. They're 10 foot tall, and they, they've got red hair, they've got double rows of teeth, and they have six digits on each hand and on each foot. And I've had people tell me, well, I've heard a lot of BS stories before, but that's, that's one of the better ones I've heard, you know, six fingers on each hand, each foot. And I said, well, John Slaw went to school with me. We went to high school together. All his kids had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. And I know other people that have had the same thing in their family. Double rows of teeth. I had double rows of teeth when I was in junior high. I can't even tell you how many times they sent me to the dentist to pull out as many teeth as I could stand at a time because I had so many extra sets of teeth. And I said, that's a genetic thing. It's not that big of a deal. Red hair obviously isn't that big of a deal. Down in Florida, guess what? The giants have red hair, double rows of teeth, six digits on each appendage and that. And so. So anyway, uh, so they found these and they've had, I've done some quite a bit of research on it and I found I think something like 37 legal ar archaeology digs at, at Lovelock Cave. Probably five times that many illegal ones. Um, anyway, a lot of the bones and different artifacts that, that were taken out went to some of the universities which were doing the digs out of California. However, uh, uh, Winnemucca, the big city of Winnemucca got some of the stuff, and I've got a whole drawer full of photographs that different people have taken. At one time, they had them out where you could see them, and then when they passed the laws that you couldn't show the human remains anymore, they went in the back room. Well, if you knew they were there, you could go sweet talk some of the museum curators, go back in the back, and they'll let you photograph the skulls at least, and they had like three skulls. Well, and by the way, you, you read the stories, and is what was a favorite thing to do in the 1800s when they'd get into these, is you take the skull like it's a motorcycle helmet and you put it on over your head. These things are huge. And so, uh, so I've got quite a few photos uh, taken from different people in Winnemucca uh, of these skulls and they always put a mold of a, of a normal jaw size next to them and they're just dwarf, very small, and they're put quarters out on the countertop or whatever. Anyway, it was always one of my big deals I was going to go photograph these. And uh, one of the guys that works for KSL right now, he's one of their head uh, TV guys, cameraman, is doing, started doing a thesis 
on giants. Now it's the second one that I know of. I read a th uh, part of a thesis of a guy back east that was doing his research around the Ohio Valley and he had a ton of good stuff. But this guy here with KSL was doing one and so he went over to photograph him. He was going to video him with, because he's a cameraman and do, he's doing a video thesis. And so he goes over and he says, I want to see your stuff. I'm doing this video thesis. And they said, uh, absolutely not. They says, two weeks ago, the federal government came in here, told us if we ever showed those to anybody again, we're all going to prison for the rest of our life. They're shutting down the museum. They're going to quarter and draw us with horses. I mean, they'd really read them the riot act. You don't show them to anybody. And he says, well, you don't understand. I'm not local Joe from the bar wanting to see them or that. I'm doing a thesis on this, scientific thesis. He says, we were told nobody gets to see them. And he says, I want to appeal to your board of directors and that. So they assem assembled the board, the museum board, and he went in and, and presented his case, and they said, absolutely not. Okay, that, that's been a couple of years ago. So here about a year ago, and by the way, every year I say, well, this summer that's real high on my bucket list. I'm going over there. And then I found out from him that they wouldn't let anybody see him anymore. And I was heartbroken, but I thought, well, if I go over and talk to him, maybe they'll at least verbally give me some information that's interesting. So here, about a year ago, uh, has it been that long since we went over? About a year ago, we went over to Win Winnemucca to the museum, and we walked in, and there was nobody else in the museum except curators, and there was two women in the back room or something, and one of them immediately came out, and she starts saying, oh, we got a car collection over here, and we got this, and, and I says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I says, I want some information on your giants. She says, I don't even know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? There's no such thing as giants. And, I, and we started in this conversation. And the more I talked to her, I think she thought I'd just come from the bar, or heard it from somebody at the bar or something. And I'd say, I'd start telling things about the history and everything. And, and when she saw I knew something, then she'd change her story and she'd add a little bit to it. But, well, it wasn't really giants. They were taller than, you know, the regular Indian was five foot four and they had couple of skeletons that were six foot tall. And, and then I'd talk to her some more and, and her story would change again. And after it changed a number of times, she finally got fed up with talking to me and figured I knew too much and that. So she walked over to a little school desk type thing and she opened the top and there was about a ream of paper of individual sheets and she pulled one off the top and came over and says, here. And she turned around and walked away and went back in the office. So I read the paper and it was a pre-printed thing that they were told by the federal government what to give you that gives you this big baloney story about there's no such thing as giants and stuff. And, and that was it. Here, go to, over to Winnemucca. But, uh, and I may have some still photos in here of some of the giants before we get out of here. If I do, I'll show them to you. Uh, let's thumb through them a little bit. Another, another thing that, uh, and again, I was going to show you some photos. Um, up in Morgan, they found a Spencer rifle over on East Canyon Creek, down below East Canyon Reservoir. A uh, family was rototilling their garden and turned up this rifle that was buried there. All the wood was gone and that, it was just the corroded metal part and everything. And uh, anyway, the family gave me the rifle. I had it for about a year and a half. Just to, they didn't give it, give it to me. They let me take it for about a year. And I did a ton of research on it. First rifle, first repeating rifle invented, very first one. People argue that the Henry was the first one, but there's plenty of evidence that the Henry was just months after this one. This is the one that really, and you never see this on TV, it's what changed the Civil War. Uh, it came out about the start of the Civil War, but the government was too skeptical to buy them because they were afraid if their supply of bullets, if their supply, oh, and by the way, the rifle was invented before the bullet was invented. So they had a repeating rifle, but no bullets to shoot in it. They had to invent those a little later on so the rifle was even usable. And um, it's kind of interesting because you can see the screws, which are pretty interesting in that. And they were all made by hand. The reason I know that in my research is because after the company went bankrupt after the war and the guy lost it, he invented the very first machine that made screws. So everything in this rifle all the screws in it were, were handmade. There was no such thing as a machine that would make screws. But it would hold seven bullets, and it, they'd come in a tube, and through the butt of the gun, you would put that tube in, and then you would, you would cock it, and then the rest of the, of the mechanism was the old flintlock mechanism. You'd pull back the big hammer, and, 
and all that kind of stuff. But uh, but when halfway through the Civil War, when they decided that the the that the uh, soldiers, uh, the northern people would would purchase these, and they started ordering them from them. And I've got a bunch of diary pieces from generals and that from the south, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. They'd have these things like you see where they've got the picket fences or whatever you call them, and there and there's an open field, and they they're behind the fences shooting back and forth, and they're still using black powder. Uh, that's all they've got for the bullets, and so they can shoot they can shoot about nearly 10 rounds to one round of the rebels halfway through the Civil War. And they'd shoot so much that then everybody would have to quit shooting for a while to let the smoke clear because you couldn't see anything and then they could start shooting at each other again. But the generals would pick somebody out because they're trying to figure out what's going on and they'd send word down the line that say, you see that guy over there? I want everybody to aim at him and kill him. And so that poor guy's just dead meat because he'd have 50 guys shooting at him or something. And they'd shoot him and then he'd send three or four runners over there, half of them would get killed, drag him back. We want to see what's going on. We don't understand what's going on here. They'd drag him back and they'd see what the rifle was, but there wasn't anything they could do because they don't have any bullets. They couldn't use the weapons anyway. But had two, there was four models made, halfway cocked with safety, all the way cocked, you're ready to fire, hold seven bullets. The one that was dug up up there was in the was in the fully cocked position. Now is what that tells me is he was in a gun battle and got killed right there. I was trying to get somebody to do enough metal x-rays on it because there's two serial numbers on it. I know where those are at. And everyone was issued with a serial number to a name. And you can still get hold of that list. And I figured if I can get somebody to x-ray and get me a number that I could read, we could go back and find out who owned the rifle. We could, through genealogy source and that, contact the family. More than likely, he was coming back. Oh, and by the way, at the end of the Civil War, you either, uh, I think you had to pay 10 bucks to keep your rifle or you had to turn it in. Most people kept their rifles. And that's what made the guy go bankrupt. Everybody that wanted a rifle had one when the war got over. And so they couldn't sell any. They tried to make some change of that. Nobody wanted a rifle. I've already got one. They went bankrupt. And so uh, uh, all their patents and everything, I think, were sold to Winchester or somebody. But, um, but anyway, uh, so I thought, boy, it would be real interesting to contact the family. If they have family history, they'll probably tell you he got released from the Civil War from the Army. He was okay. He was happy. He was heading home. And then he disappeared. Nobody ever heard of him. And I could tell him I know where he's bones or probably are. He was in some kind of battle with Indians or outlaws or something and halfway through the battle, and of course x-raying him, we could have told how many bullets were still in, had unfired inside the gun and so forth. Couldn't ever get anybody to do it, so finally I ended up giving it back to the family. But um, this is part of my research just on, on the rifle, and I've got stacks and stacks of research on it, but uh, very interesting thing. Uh, now uh, we got to hurry to get into some of these stories. Uh, this, talking about maps, this is another one that I've made from information I've collected. This is out in the Drum Mountain area. And uh, some old sheep herders found some ancient writing out there. Uh, five boulders in a circle with a bunch of ancient writing on all of the five boulders. We've gone out a number of times trying to find it and, so, and every time I, every time we go out, I come back and, and go to the family again and say, well, this is what we found, this is where we're at. And they go, oh, you're really close. You just need to go another 100 yards. So I think we're to the point now where we can probably go up and find it. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, uh, let's see. We'll skip a ton of this stuff so that, like I say, I've got hundreds and hundreds of stories. I'm just trying to pull some of the, a few pretty good ones out for you to hear. Just because it, I know everybody gets tired of reading their books and everything and you read the same story over and over and over and they, everybody thinks that's all there is and it's not true. There's there's tons of stuff out there. New stuff. Um, here's another map. So these are the kind of things. I've got drawers full of this kind of stuff. This is another map that's given to me by a guy who's dead now. And and it's they're not too hard to read. Can you can you make out stuff on there pretty easy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, and so when they're modern day map and that, they're pretty easy to read. He's even given me GPS coordinates and that on it. And is what this is, is uh, this is out uh, south of uh, Delta. And uh, it's real close to a 
County Road. He was, in fact, he was driving down the road and got a flat tire. Went to put his spare on and his spare was flat. And so by the time he made phone calls and everything, he's out there like four hours before somebody comes and rescues him. And so while he's out there, he's just wandering around, you know, kicking rocks, figuring something to do for four hours. And he comes across all kinds of Indian petroglyphs and that, but the thing that was the most interesting to me, and he shows you petroglyphs and everything on here, but he shows you all kinds of details. He shows you where there's railroad bridges and different things, so you know exactly where, where you're at. Uh, we've been out there. Um, but he, but he found, come across about a three acre spot, three acre spot that's totally covered with obsidian from making arrowheads. That had to been like a war with a million people in it to make that many arrowheads. And I know a few other places in the state that are like that. And so, so lots and lots of ancient Indian activity out in this spot. But that's, that's another one. Unfortunately, I have a lot of this kind of map. Now tell me where that's at. I have no idea. <laughs> and neither do I, but, that, but I drew that. <laughs> and I've got a lot of them, you know, and if you don't, if people tell you, or even if they draw it and they're pointing and saying, okay, this is such and such, and this is, you know, whatever, and this is the road, and this is whatever, and you go, yeah, yeah, I understand all that stuff, and then you take it home and throw it in your drawer and you pull it out five years later. And you go, I wonder what the heck that was, and, and where it was. That's probably, I think this is probably where there's 100 tons of gold bars, but I'm not sure. But, but, uh, but I got a lot of those, and, th and that's unfortunate. And, I, and I've got even more where we didn't even draw a picture, and, and the intent was, as soon as I get home, you know, I'm going to, from memory, I'm going to draw something, and uh, so I can remember where it's at. Now, that being said, let's talk a little bit that way really quick. Uh, uh, so far, we're going to be getting out of time, and I haven't got into the ones that, to turn off your... Yeah, keep going. Uh, anyway, uh, fairly recently, a guy by the name of Jason was building himself a new home. And, uh, and I'm, by the way, my profession is I'm building official, and so, uh, so I got to see him quite a bit. And as we got talking, uh, he starts telling me and, uh, that his wife... Her great-great-grandpa had run into a Spanish guy uh, down in the Ogden area or something, and this guy had an old map, an old Spanish map, and he showed it to him. Hey, what do you think of this? Can you tell me anything of that? And he looked it over pretty good and told him what he could or whatever, and the guy says, you know, that's all, all, her, all she wrote, takes his map and leaves. Well, from memory, he immediately sits down, just like we're talking about, and he redraws the map from memory. And from that, he goes out and he finds the mine. And a lot of you may have heard of it. It's another one of our lost Josephine, besides the one up above uh, Camas. This one's over in Wellsville, or uh, Wallsburg. Wallsburg. Okay, Wallsburg. And so, uh, a lot of interesting stuff, and I've seen some of the photos and so forth, but this started three generations ago. He finds the mine, five entrances to the mine, to this Spanish mine. Goes way back in. Back in the 70s, I got some of the lost treasure, some of the treasure hunting magazines, and they had a really interesting several page article of that particular mine where they'd got a piece of a buffalo skull, and it had a map on it. It was circular, and it had little notches all the way around it. Uh, it might have been something to do with compass points or something. And then it had uh, drainages carved on it, and it showed about six or seven Spanish mines on this buffalo skull map. They found all kinds of other things in the mine. They've, uh, they've found a lot of fire pits. They've found uh, different maps. They've found buffalo skulls. they found all kinds of things. Three generations they've been digging out and they've never got to the back of any of the shafts yet. Jason told me that he's been back in over a half mile and he says still haven't. Because I asked him, I says, well how good are the veins and stuff? Don't know. Nobody's ever got to the back of one of the shafts yet to tell. But uh, he's been working on, in fact, I just emailed him again yesterday. His grandfather is the latest one that had the claim, and he died recently. And his step-grandmother, they have kept diaries 
from day one and photographs and that of everything that's happened in that mine. I asked him if there was any chance of me getting my hands on that and he's working on that. He's been working on it for a number of months to get it from the family and I'm, I'm hopeful to get hold of those diaries and photos and everything of that particular mine. But for them to fill those in half a mile deep to fill them all the way in and that, they have to be, the, the Indians didn't bother if the, I can take you out to a bunch of Spanish mines that are worked out. You don't hide those, no reason to. But the ones, when you, when you kill the Spaniards off and so forth, the ones that you gotta be concerned with are if more Spaniards are gonna come and put, enslave you again back in that same mine. If you can, can sell it to the point nobody can find it, they can't work in the mine. That's why so many of them are concealed. And oftentimes you're gonna find the remainder of the Spaniard bodies inside those concealed mines if you find them. The reason being that the Indians were considered as animals, but they had to they had to be baptized. They knew what was going on. They knew that uh, if you didn't get your last rites, you were condemned to purgatory for eternity. Worst thing that could happen to you. Well, to get even with people, what are you gonna do? Well, when we kill them, we're gonna throw them in there and we're gonna bury it so nobody can ever find them and they're going to be in purgatory for the rest of life and their family's going to know they're in purgatory for the rest of life because their bones and, and their remains will never be found and they'll never get the last rites. So, um, so oftentimes there is Spanish remains in these types of mines and I can tell you, I could tell you if we had enough time about some of my mines I've found and different things, some interesting stories. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture here real quick. Since a lot of what we're going to talk about is maps, that is bigger than real life. That's about the size of a piece of Wonder Bread. In fact, the reason it was picked up was because the two guys were out arrowhead hunting. Uh, the one guy saw it laying on the ground and thought he'd pick it up and tell his buddy, hey, I found a petrified piece of Wonder Bread. So he picks it up off the ground. It was face down. And this is an Indian map. And I know it's a long ways back that I wish I could project it. I had it on there and lost it. But there's, some, there's four parallel lines here, which is more than likely a river. And you've got a bunch of peaks here and a bunch of peaks here. And so you've got this side of the river going up into the mountains and you've got this side of the river going up into the mountains. And I've gone over this thing with magnifiers and everything I can to find X marks a spot or something to tell me what this map's about. And there is nothing on the map of that sort. And this is my speculation, but I think the way that this map was used by the Indians was I'd get with my buddy and I'd say, you, you see that mountain peak over there? That's this one here. See this cane right here? There's some really nice elk in there if you want, if you want to go up and shoot. And then if you, want, if you want to get a mountain sheep, come over here right on this side. There's a bunch of them or something. I think that's how that's used because there's nothing to show you where, where to go on this map. It just shows a whole bunch of mountain peaks. I have not gone back yet, but I know where this was found, and I want to go back and look around in that area, see if I can determine the river and the mountain peaks that match up with this. But again, there's nothing to show a campground. They, you know, they, they might do that too. Go take your camp, put it right here. There's some fresh water there, you know, that kind of thing, and you can look at that and and uh, kind of kind of go that way or something. I don't know how else that would be used, but that's a, a carved-in Indian map that was found down in southern Utah. Could there be another piece of the map that would show something? We, we looked at it pretty close and I don't think so. It doesn't look like anything's broken off from it. Well, I got way too much stuff to show you guys and we've still got some great stories to tell you. Uh, just real quick, here's some of the some of the Roman coins and that that have been found in the last couple of years. Oh, here's, we were talking about the giants. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yell at me if I'm not showing you guys. You can't see them real good there. Those are bigger than, than what they actually are. But, uh, and I've got quite a few photos of different groups of coins like that. This right here is one of the Southern Utah uh, giant burials. And I can tell you about different ones in the state and so forth, and they're kind of similar. Uh, this particular one is solid sandstone, 17 feet across, and 47 feet deep. They dug it out of a solid piece of sandstone. This thing that you see going around here is a 11 inch wide 
shelf that spirals from the top all the way to the bottom. You can't walk on it or anything. It's not wide enough. Don't have any idea what the purpose was. When you go down 47 feet, get to the bottom, then you go through a little hole in the side into another chamber they dug out, and there's three 10-foot giants in there uh, in the burials. Another one that's down, and that's real close to the, to the southern boundary of, of Utah, down in the Kanab area a couple of years ago, uh, they located some Indian caves, and out in front of them, in the caves there was a lot of petroglyphs and so forth, even on the roof of the cave, and out in front of them, there again in solid sandstone, but not near as deep as this one, they dug circular holes in the sandstone. There was no, there was no spiral shelf, but it was dug in solid sandstone. They dug down, and they're again giant burials. They, they bury three giants in each one. They put them down in there in fetal position facing to the east. They cover them with sand until the body's covered with sand. Then they put a six inch cap of blue clay on top of that and then the next burial goes on top of that. Once they've got three burials in the hole they fill it all the rest of the way up and then they go to another one. But there's quite a few of them up in that particular area. Um, Let's see, what else can we show you here real quick? We got to get into, we haven't got into the good stuff yet. Um, all right. Let, Why haven't they taken pictures and documented these 10 foot giants in southern Utah? What? They, they're documented, but you can't take them to the government or anybody because because they quiet the whole thing up. They don't exist. Uh, it's just like, uh, right, uh, I got permission, and hopefully, because I didn't call him recently, and he said a small group, and I don't know if this is considered a small group, and I'll back up a little bit. All right, camera's off at this point. All recording off. We'll try to cover a